Hey guys, this is our next segment, the fifth one I believe in the geologic uh, time. And uh, we're gonna have to do this example here. The cobalt radioactive um, isotope is used to treat cancer. Like, you know, we're gonna talk about the using isotopes in, in nuclear medicine. So for now, it's just an example. So in this, um, in this process, the cobalt-60 is decaying by beta decay. So let's do the equations. Cobalt-60, it's only given to us, like the, the 60. And so therefore, this is the mass number. And it's cobalt-1 out with 60 right there. So we're going to look up the atomic number of cobalt and that's 27 so we write the 27 right here and it decays by beta so we put the the symbol of the beta I hope you're doing it in front of me I mean <clears throat> before me and you're just checking it if I did it right uh, so it's gonna be uh, the beta particle right here it's the electron minus one and zero so how do we calculate the atomic number of the new element? Remember, the, the number of protons goes up by one because one neutron loses an electron and becomes a proton. So the 27 will be uh, 28. I hope that's what you said. So it's going to be 28. Does the mass number change? Say no, because it doesn't. And it's going to stay 60. And now we're going to look up what is 28, and that is nickel. So when this process happens, the cobalt is going to turn into nickel by a beta particle. So we did it. You can go home and tell everyone that now you mastered the nuclear equations, and everybody will just look, oh, my God, she's really smart, because they don't really have, they don't really have any idea about what is nuclear equation, but now you do. So this is a good good thing so let's go further we're gonna talk about the radioactive isotopes now uh, and just about every element has at least one radioactive isotope uh, there are elements which has more uh, for example we do have the hydrogen that only has one uh, but those are well known the hydrogen when it uh, when it has the first one is, is the hydrogen one, and in that case, the hydrogen have one proton and no electron. So that's, the mass number is gonna be one. Now the next case is when the hydrogen not only have one proton, but also has a neutron. So then the mass number is gonna be, you're right, two. So that is hydrogen two. But there is a third one, and we call it tritium, you know, the second one, actually, when it's two, it's called deuterium. And when you ha when you buy heavy water, if you've ever heard about some people are selling the heavy water, thinking that it's better than the other. But the, when you when you buy heavy water, all the difference is that it it has some deuterium, which means it's the mass number is twice as uh, twice of the other ones because it's two. So therefore, it's twice as heavy as the other one because, because the hydrogen is normally one, and in this case, it's two. So that's the deuterium. And when you have two neutrons and one proton, that's the tritium. In that case, the mass number is three. And the tritium actually is radioactive, and the half-life of it, we're going to talk in a minute, is about 15 years. And what they use the tritium for is to, to measure the age of the water going through the ground. So we can tell at what time the water actually got into underground and how long has it stayed before it made it to the surface again. It's a very interesting method we can do uh, to date the water actually. About, uh, oh, it's an interesting thing. I, I see it right here that the, some heavier elements have more radioactive isotopes like the platinum have as many as 30. Uh, and not only the naturally occurring ra radioactive isotopes, but also humans actually can produce radioactive isotopes. The way they do it is that they actually bombard the, the nucleus of the elements in um, 
reactors or accelerators. Uh, and this is the way we can actually use them in nuclear medicine, but not only nuclear medicine, but agri agriculture and a lot of other ways. And we're going to industrial uh, uses. We're going to talk just a little bit about it in a minute. And especially when we produce uh, radioactive elements uh, artificially, it's very important how fast they are decaying. And that takes us actually in a minute to the decay rate. But before we get there, the question is, how do we use these uh, radioactive elements? And uh, as I just mentioned, uh, the, the human-made radioactive isotopes are currently used in, in a vari variety of applications, such as food and agriculture, industry, and to me, most importantly, in the medicine. In the food and agriculture, the, I just made up this slide because it it really was very interesting to me and I, I kind of want you to know about it that um, the ra radiation is is mainly for food preservation so it's a better way to preserve food than put chemicals in it because the radiation is is going to be gone so I don't think it makes such a big difference in the food so the other the other reason they use radiation is is the insect eradication when they when they um, put radiation on on the plants basically what happens by the radiation the insects are going to be unable to reproduce so so basically they won't have kids so basically they're gonna die out very soon the fertilizer labeling that just means that they they are able to measure how long the fertilizer is staying in this soil so that's very very good if they do want to genetically alternate any plants they use radiation and also they use it for sterilization i'm not gonna uh, mention a lot about the industrial applications if you're interested in you can always look it up however i'm gonna talk about how do we use it in medicine the radioisotopes are key in nuclear medicine for example i had uh, an overactive thyroid disease called Graves disease and uh, my thyroid was overacting so hard that that I couldn't even help anything anymore hold anything anymore my my hands were shaking like really really bad I couldn't hold anything and my heart rate was around 100 so it turned out that I have Graves disease Graves disease which is overactive thyroid they used um, when I went to the nuclear medicine department in the hospital, they actually gave me uh, iodine isotopes to check what is wrong with my thyroid. And that's how they learned that I had Graves' disease. And the second time that they used radioactive element on me is when they gave me a dose of iodine-131. So now we know that is that is the mass number of iodine. So it's a, it's a um, man-made, iodine isotope which is supposed to kill my thyroid because the iodine is strictly going into your thyroid and i asked the doctor actually how uh what is the half-life of the iodine and he was really surprised and i had to tell him that i do know something about chemistry but um he told me that the half-life was seven days and that will take us in a minute to the half-life and and how important that is so uh, we not only use uh, the radioactive um, elements or, or isotopes in medicine to kill like thyroids, but also they use killing cancer cells. They use it for sterilization. And most of all, they use it for medical diagnosis. And remember I told you that the beta particle is going into your body by one inch. So most of the cancer treatments are using beta emitters, elements which are uh, decaying with beta decay. So therefore it goes right uh, into the cancer cells and will not go anywhere else. So you know the, the radiation is really bad and the radiation therapy is not only killing the cancer cells but others too. So it's very, very important that you target to the cancer area and it doesn't go anywhere else.
So this is just a couple of uh, this is just a couple of isotopes used in in the medical treatment. I put it in just because most of us didn't know about it. So I was just thinking that this is a good way to to learn about nuclear medicine just a little bit. But it's really interesting, and I didn't know it myself. However, my my doctor at the time told me that my uh, radioactive iodine was made in Canada and was uh, shipped in for me to Roanoke on that morning. Like, there is one place in the medicine where you cannot be late for your appointment, and that is when you have an appointment in the nuclear medicine department, because actually they measure, they measure it out just for you. Depending on your body size and age and everything, they will make a sample which is exactly good for you. Because they don't want to kill your whole body, they just want to kill that low area on your body. So they calculate how much of the radioactive iodine I had to take. And I had to be there at 8 a.m. in the morning and had to take my radioactive pill. And I was told that I am radiating, glowing in the dark, so I couldn't be with anyone for a while and couldn't go to the bathroom or I had to be by myself really for the first two days because that's when I had most of the radioactive elements in my body. So where do they make these uh, man-made radioactive isotopes for medical purposes? The funny thing is that there is no place in the U.S. where they would do it. Most of them are coming from, as you can see, South Africa. A lot of it comes from Europe. And I guess most of the one which is used in the U.S. is coming from Canada. But interestingly, it even comes from Europe. There is not one reactor in North America, I mean in the USA, which makes radioactive medicine. And if you look at it, the whole radioactive medicine in the world, 60% of all of it is used in the USA. And it's weird that we don't make them in this country. Anyhow, that's about the nuclear medicine. And now we're going to talk about that some naturally occurring radioactive isotopes uh, are used for uh, measuring rock samples to define their age. And actually, really, we want to define the age of the Earth, the universe, the sun, all of it. Now, the most commonly used isotopes are right here. The reason that we can actually use them, because they have longer half-lives. They don't decay fast. So therefore, they are around enough that we can measure systematically the abundance of the parent isotope versus the abundance of the daughter isotope. So therefore, we can define the age of our rock samples. So this is very important also, and we call this slide here geology clocks, that each radioactive element will decay at its own, at, at its own constant rate, uh, and every radioactive isotope has a very, very characteristic uh, decay rate, and the way actually we measure it is the half-life. and. Um, the half-life actually is the time, uh, the half-life is the time which, uh, which, which it takes for half of the radioactive elements, half of the radioactive isotopes in a sample to decay. So you have a sample, it originally had 10,000, radioactive isotope and the half-life is equal with the time during which half of those original isotopes decaying which means from 10,000 it goes into 5,000 so the half-life is the time which it takes for half of the radioactive elements in the sample to decay it's very very important that that you understand that the so this here is the half-life that the half-life is independent on the physical state. It doesn't matter if it's solid, liquid, or gas. It doesn't matter what is the temperature. It's independent of the pressure. It's independent on the chemical 
uh, compound in which the nucleus finds itself. And it doesn't matter what kind of uh, outside influence uh, works on the sample. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter what kind of chemistry the, the surface has. And it's independent of every kind of ordinary physical factors of the outside world. So we, we can basically say that the decay rate is stable. The only thing which can which can alter the decay rate, or we can say the half-life of the radioactive element is a direct nuclear interaction with a particle, basically a nuclear, nuclear reactor when you bombard the, the uh, nucleus, which naturally won't happen. So therefore, we, we trustworthy can use these radioactive elements to define the age of rock samples. And I'm going to continue in the next segment.